testing lab this week. In case you were tired of aspirin, we're going to make it. Um, so general concepts behind this lab is this is going to be your first synthetic, full synthetic lab. So it's what you would expect a synthetic chemist to do in the real world. So what we're trying to do is now correlate what you would do uh, to prepare for this class and then what you would do if you were outside of this class, industry setting, that kind of deal. So there's, we've narrowed it down into pretty much five bulk categories. You get preparation for the lab, the reaction itself, isolation, identification, and then concluding and putting everything together. So what most people tend to think about for organic chemistry is the reaction, which ends up being a very, very, very small portion of what any synthetic chemist does. Okay? So what we're trying to do is show you what everything else is. Okay? So as far as the preparation goes, so we've got on the left here what a synthetic chemist would have to do and prepare for uh, before starting the experiment. So what they would end up doing is evaluating the reaction in the theory, and to do that, they'd go into the literature resources, look things up, um, find out how the different mechanisms are working, what's going on between each of the chemicals, different roles or everything. Okay, so it's a lot of extra work. What you end up doing is reading the lab manual, so preparing for the procedure, okay? reading the Making Connections book, so looking up the different techniques, and then ideally participating in recitation. Okay, which means working on the group activities, answering my inane questions, that kind of fun stuff. Okay? Um, once that's completed, what a synthetic chemist would do is understand or use that understanding to plan a specific, a specific procedure. Okay? What reagents do they want to use? What changes are they going to make? That kind of general idea. For you guys, you're going to be following a procedure that we've already given to you. So what you need to do is then take that procedure, translate it into your own words, and make it understandable for yourself. Okay? Um, ideally, you would also include an overall reaction. A synthetic chemist would then obtain whatever chemicals were necessary for that experiment and, in the same time, get the safety information. Okay? So whenever you purchase chemicals, one of the things that all suppliers are required to do is ship uh, safety information with the chemical. So as soon as a synthetic chemist gets the chemical, they're now aware of all the safety hazards. Okay? Since you aren't purchasing your chemicals, we're going to make you go look for that information. So you would have to search for those MSDS uh, sheets, get that information, summarize it, so that in case of an emergency, you'd be prepared, know what to do, how to clean up spills, that kind of fun thing. Okay? The next fun part would be determining the amount of chemicals, um, and in particular, coming up with expectations. What would we expect to happen as a yield at the end of the reaction? Okay. For you guys, this is going to be very similar to a synthetic chemist. You're going to calculate your limiting reagents. You're going to calculate your theoretical yield. Okay. The reason we do all that is so that we know what values are going to be really important to us. If it's a limiting reagent, we want to know that value super, super accurately. So we're going to spend our time to make sure we nail down that number specifically. Okay? Um, theoretical yield ends up being important. So if while the reaction's occurring, okay, or while you're trying to isolate it, if you end up with, say, 5 grams at the end of it, okay, if you had a theoretical yield calculation that told you that you should have ended up with 0.5 grams, you now know that you're not done with the experiment. You apparently have a ton of impurities. You should go back through and try and clean things up some more, okay? Or try and figure out what went wrong with your experiment. So by having this information ahead of time, you can start to estimate and plan uh, for changes during the experiment, okay? The very last thing that we would ask is, how is it going to be successful? So yield was one thing that we could do real quickly, but then we could also go through and do identification techniques like melting point, IR, and TLC. So the three big common ones that you guys have dealt with so far. Okay. So as also part of the preparation, we'd want to look at the reaction. And in theory, we should understand the mechanism of this reaction so that we could then adjust and predict accordingly. The mechanism or the chemistry behind this actual experiment uh, is something that you probably wouldn't see until the end of second semester organic chemistry which means you don't have to worry about the mechanism. What you're more concerned about is the role of each of these species, what they're doing, how they're acting, that kind of thing. So you'd be identifying reagents, the solvents, catalysts, all that kind of fun terms, or all those terminologies. 
Okay? So as part of interpreting this, we could go through and start to piece together where things went. Okay? So we've got our salicylic acid. Where does that end up going? Do we lose that entire structure? No, it ends up in our products. Okay, so we've got salicylic acid showing up in our product, just now it's altered. We could also go through and do that same idea or that same logic behind, that was the wrong button, um, behind the other components. For instance, the acetic anhydride. Whoops, circled the wrong part. We could go through and look at the pieces of the acetic anhydride and see where they end up showing up. Okay? So we get that piece breaking apart. Okay? So what we're trying to do is just understand the bulk differences, where things have changed, how things have changed during the reaction. Okay? Since uh, salicylic acid and acetic anhydride directly show up in your final product of aspirin, those are going to be really important reagents. Those are going to be critical to the reaction actually occurring. We also end up adding, uh, right in the middle here, H3O+. Plus. Okay. <coughs> what is that species going to do in this case? H3O plus is not water. It's related to water, but it supplies, someone else said it, hydrogen ion. Okay. It acts as a catalyst. It's going to supply acid to this structure. Okay. That catalyst is going to alter our mechanism, and it's going to alter it in such a way that what happens? What do catalysts do? They speed the reaction. Okay. So we're going to add the catalyst to make our reaction go faster so we can get done with lab faster. Okay. How do they speed the reaction? They lower the activation energy for the reaction to occur so we can put in less energy and we can get that reaction to occur faster. Okay? How important is the presence of that catalyst? Is it necessary to produce the product? <coughs> no. Okay? It makes the reaction go faster, but it's not necessary. So what does that mean if we were going to, say, try and calculate a theoretical yield or a limiting reagent? Should we be concerned about the concentration of the catalyst? No, it's not directly relevant to producing product. We won't worry about calculating it as a limiting reagent. Okay? To figure out your limiting reagent, you're trying to find the starting reagent that produces the smallest mole value of your product. Okay? That just means that once we reach that limit, we can't produce anymore. So what you end up doing, having to do is go through and do a conversion, much like you did in Gen Chem. In fact, it's exactly like you should have done in Gen Chem. You convert the moles of your starting material into moles of product. But typically, how do we measure things in, in lab? Do we measure moles? No, we measure grams, typically, if we're looking at a solid, which means the very first thing we're going to have to do is convert those grams into moles. You use that, or to do that conversion, that's what this calculation is showing. You take your mass, and you divide it by the molecular weight of your compound. Okay? That would give you the moles of that material. How could you convert your moles of starting material now into moles of product? Mm, nope. You end up having to go back to your balanced equation. So we'd go back to the equation and see what the relationship is. If I give you one molecule of salicylic acid, how many molecules of aspirin could you potentially make? Only one. How do you know it's one? Not quite limiting reagent, not even dealing with that. Simpler. Looking at the equation, how do you know it's 1? It's a 1 to 1 ratio. How do you know it's a 1 to 1 ratio? Well, in theory, we've got implied 1s across the board okay, in front of each of those reagents, showing us that it's a 1 to 1 ratio. The other thing we could do instead of looking at those 1s is check the individual pieces. If I take one molecule of salicylic acid, Okay, where does that show up in the product? It only shows up one time in the product. There's our one-to-one -one ratio as well. Okay? Both of those are ultimately the same thing. Um, that's interesting. Uh, after you get your limiting reagent, you can go through and determine your theoretical yield, okay? which is the most that you could make given the reagents 
starting, you're starting with. That's going to be dependent on your limiting reagent. So whatever your limiting reagent is, whatever that calculation comes out to be as far as converting it over to products, that's your theoretical yield. Okay? All we talked about was converting it to moles. And as far as the calculation goes, a theoretical yield in moles is still a theoretical yield. But is that mole unit as useful to us? Remember, we want to use this in lab. What are we going to measure in lab? Probably a mass. So having a mole unit, while it may be a valid theoretical yield unit, isn't particularly useful for us in lab because we can't measure moles. So it makes sense to convert it into grams using molecular weight so that we can then compare quickly in lab. Okay. Once we've got all that background information down and we're ready to move, what we can do is start the reaction in class okay, or in lab. In this case, you're going to mix all your reagents together in a test tube. You're going to put that test tube in a hot water bath, and you're going to let it heat at roughly 50 degrees for 15 minutes. Okay? Um, that 50 degrees isn't super critical to nail down at exactly 50, but for the most part, we don't want it too hot. If we heat it up too much, we start to give our reaction enough energy that other things can occur. Okay, so we would reduce our yield. Um, as long as your water's not boiling or even simmering, you're probably good enough. Okay, so if you want to get out a thermometer and make sure it stays at 50, you can, but you'll probably be fine to just heat it up and just make sure it doesn't boil. Okay? Body temperature is 37 degrees, so if it burns your hand, it's probably too hot. Ideally, you don't find out by burning your hand, but you get a general idea of how hot it is. Okay? The other big deal that's going on with this, the acetic anhydride is a liquid. Your catalyst is also being added as a liquid, and your starting material, your salicylic acid, is added as a solid. For this reaction to occur, our salicylic acid has to interact with the acetic anhydride, which means they have to touch each other. Okay? If we've got a solid and a liquid, where's the only place those two things interact? The interface of those two phases. What if you have crystals that aren't at that interface? Or if you have some molecules of salicylic acid that aren't at the interface, can they react? They never touch the acetic anhydride, which means no, no reaction. So what could you do to help speed or increase that surface area? You could stir it. Okay? One of the things that you're hoping for in this reaction is that everything dissolves. Okay? The most common mistake I've seen with this experiment is everybody mixing the reagents and just heating it and assuming it's working. Okay? You sometimes have to actively push those molecules to interact with each other. And that's why we're going to end up stirring as well. Or I would recommend you stir as well. Okay? Once you've done your 15 minutes of heat, you'll take it off. You're going to end up adding some water to that. I'm pretty sure the procedure asks for that. Uh, and as it cools, we would in theory see crystals. What would those crystals most likely be? Aspirin. That's what we're trying to make, so it makes sense to see aspirin start to form. Okay, what else could those crystals be? Salicylic acid. Okay, what's the liquid? We've got acetic acid. We'll probably have some water in there. What else might be in there? some of the acid catalyst. Okay, so pretty much anything that's a liquid is floating around in that liquid state or even soluble in that liquid. Okay? So our very first step once we finish the reaction is now to isolate. We've got this solution or this mixture of solids and liquids. Our solid is the aspirin. We need to get rid of all of the liquid. So what's the easiest way to separate a solid from a liquid? You filter. Okay? That's going to remove a lot of those liquid impurities that we don't want and leave us with our crystalline product. However, it's probably not pure. It probably has some unreacted salicylic acid in it, and it probably still has some of the other liquids still present as well. So what can we do to fully purify? It begins with an R. We can recrystallize. Okay? There are other techniques that you may or that we will end up discussing later on in the semester. Those are listed on the left. Okay, you can go through and do extractions, distillations, chromatography, sublimation, all sorts of other fun things to do. Okay. At the end of the recrystallization, what should we have left over? 
we should have pure aspirin. How can we prove that you have pure aspirin? We can go through our identification procedure, and we can run a melting point. Why not a boiling point? It's probably too high. It's in the solid state to begin with. Let's pick the easier one to calculate or determine, so we'll run a melting point. What would we expect of our melting point? We should have a very narrow range, so one to two degrees as far as our range goes. That would signify what? That it's pure. Could you identify your compound based on that range? Not just the range, what would we have to do? Compare it to the literature value. And what would we expect? It should be very similar or very close to the literature value for aspirin. Okay? That would then tell us that we've got a pure product and that it's aspirin. What else could we do to help uh, identify our compound? We could do a TLC plate. So what we'd end up doing is running a TLC plate against pure aspirin, or what we've decided is pure aspirin. And what would we expect to see? The RF value should be exactly the same, because it's the same compound. What else might you expect to see on that TLC plate that could give you some evidence towards how <coughs> successful you were in the experiment? What's that? Should you see other compounds? No. So when you look at your pure substance, when you run your TLC, you would expect to see just one spot. Okay? We could also run spectroscopy. The only version of spectroscopy you guys are aware of so far is IR. So we'll run an IR spectra. What would you expect to see with the IR? What kind of analysis would we expect you to do? No analysis? You just compare it to the literature value. So we'll look up the literature value of aspirin, and you just compare those two. Okay? You've not only synthesized it, but you then purified it, much more so than you did with the last experiment, because we did a recrystallization, okay? which means how closely should your spectrum match? It should be very, very, very close, virtually identical. Okay? The last thing that were a couple other spectroscopy things that we could use would be NMR which we'll learn at the very end of the semester in lab, but you'll do practice with that in lecture. We could also do mass spec, which we're not going to do in lab, but you'll see that in lecture as well. Okay? The very last thing that we could do is do a chemical test. Okay? It's one that you're not going to end up running, and it's uh, a test that we typically don't use in organic synthesis. Why would we not use a chemical test? We want the product, and the result of the chemical test is destruction of the product. So while it does give us some information, we end up destroying our product at the same time. It just doesn't make sense to go through and do that. Okay? What's the last thing you could do to prove how awesome you were at this experiment? We just did melting point. It's a hint. It's not up here. And not take it. What's that? No, we're not going to ingest this. What did you guys calculate at the beginning of the experiment? Uh, yeah. A theoretical yield. How close were you to your theoretical yield? If you did a really good job, we would assume that you would be close to it. How would we set that up? We'd look at a percent yield. Okay? So you'll end up finishing your experiment with a percent yield. Okay? To very finalize everything, you would go through, clean up everything, throw away all of your waste into the appropriate waste containers, Write up some brief conclusion of your results in your lab notebook, get it signed off, and you'd be done with the lab, and you could then leave. Okay? One more thing about the percent yield. Okay? Why might you have to recalculate the theoretical yield at the end of class? That shouldn't change your theoretical yield. That just says your experiment was weird. Is it um because you don't know exactly how much you're going to weigh out. Your theoretical yield is dependent on how much you started with. When you calculate it at the beginning of class or before you get into lab, you're going based upon what the lab manual tells you to do. What are the odds that you get exactly that amount? Probably not that great 
which means your theoretical yield will also change. Okay? So you might have to calculate that real quickly at the end of class too. As far as the recitation activity go or the recitation goes, that's the end of it. I'm going to include some numbers up here in case you forgot your lab manual, though the lab manual will be helpful with a lot of the questions in the group activity. Go ahead and work on the group activity. If you've got questions, raise your hand, and Chandrani or I will be there to help you out.